The fourth and final volume of Kirschlein's Traité de l'Orchestration continues the section called Orchestration proprement dite, which is chapter four, and then adds two more chapters, one of them about different kinds of instrumental ensembles, and the last one about orchestral color. This continuation of chapter four, which started in the previous volume, goes into many very important problems in depth. First, there is a detailed discussion of orchestration with voices. This is a big subject, since when composers write for the voice, the voice is normally in the foreground with words. Most of the time this occurs in operas and the words are very important there, since the listener needs to understand at least the main lines of the narrative. Gershner starts by looking at the various ways voices are used. Restative, different kinds of areas, expressive melodies, and emotional explosions. There's a long section on various ways to orchestrate without drowning out the voices. Of course, the accompaniment depends on the kind of vocal writing in the given passage. For example, a light, playful passage is not the same as one where the voice is on long, expressive high notes in a very dramatic situation. Since a human voice is nowhere near as strong as a full orchestra, this requires a lot of craftsmanship. Of course, it would be easy to just use a few instruments with the voice, but over time, this ends up making a large orchestra seem superfluous. Essentially, this section is about the many ways to use the orchestra as an accompaniment. Here are the various textures Kirschlein discusses in detail, with many examples. Sustained notes, or what we call today, pads. Repeated notes. Tremolos and trills. Pizzicato or harp. Arpeggio figuration of various kinds. Using the strings and contrapuntal textures. Mixtures of strings and woodwinds. Situations where the woodwinds or the horns are in the foreground. Brass chords. More complex textures and doubling the vocal line in the orchestra. In discussing each of these, the examples always mention the emotional character required by the storyline of the opera. Then Kirschlein goes on to discuss ways of using the orchestra as an accent during a vocal line. This is important because sometimes the best thing to do is to leave the vocal line unaccompanied or with very minimal accompaniment, and then the orchestra can simply underline an important moment or even dramatically interrupt the voice. Kirschler also lists the combinations which can drown out the voice. He then goes into some detail about Wagnerian operatic orchestration, since Wagner tends to use massive instrumental groups. Of course, singing in a Wagner opera requires a particularly powerful voice and lots of endurance. After this, Kirschler goes on to look at vocal ensembles, like groups of soloists, duos, trios, quartets, and larger groups. This leads to a detailed discussion of orchestration with choir. This is different from orchestration with soloists, since choirs can be very large. Here there are examples of monophonic textures, examples in two, three, or four parts, monophonic vocal lines accompanied by harmony in the orchestra, and vice versa. Then Kirchner looks at how the orchestra can add counterpoint, or touches of color, to the voices, followed by full harmony, but where the part writing for the orchestra and for the voices isn't the same. There's also a section about dialogue between orchestra and choir, and even about choirs without words as part of an orchestral texture. The next section of this chapter is about orchestrating piano or organ music, as well as how to orchestrate chamber music. Each of these situations poses specific challenges. It's important not just to transcribe the original music note for note, you need to rethink it in orchestral terms. Then there are examples of various orchestrations of the same passage, including single chords. There's an interesting section about orchestrating very loud passages, since certain issues of orchestral balance come more to the fore when the musicians are playing loud. Here are the textures he discusses. Contrapuntal dispositions, homophonic textures, counterpoint with sustained harmony in the background, melody accompaniment in bass, and various other kinds of texture that aren't so easily classified. He gives examples of loud passages from classical, romantic, and living composers at that time, of course, since the book was published in 1951. To end this chapter of his book, Kirschland discusses polytonal and atonal music since they pose specific challenges of their own. As usual, he goes into specific examples and discusses why they work. The following chapter is about different kinds of ensembles. Most of the book so far has been about more or less standard orchestras. Here he discusses chamber music, chamber orchestras, with reference to Millot, Schoenberg, and Satie. When talking about smaller orchestral ensembles, he also mentions jazz, operettas, and specifically discusses how to orchestrate the main lines, the accompaniments, and the bass lines, as well as how to use the saxophone and the piano, not as soloists, but just as members of the ensemble. Then he gives examples of the same chord orchestrated for different ensembles. Finally, as a section on writing for wind bands, 
how to transcribe pieces for orchestra for band, as well as a short section about the effects of different keys. For example, when the strings are playing in keys that include open strings, they're more brilliant. The final chapter in Kirchlein's treatise is called Orchestral Color. This is about the influence of timbre on musical character. Of course, the other aspects of the music, like tempo, register, articulation, and so on, make a big difference as well. But there's no denying that the same melody played by the low flute or the high trumpet will have a very different character. And Kirchlein always explains why the colors he's talking about are appropriate to the musical character. It's important to note that even when talking about one instrument, things like register and articulation are part of the discussion. For example, when talking about the flute, examples of the following characters. Incisive, idyllic, luminous, magic, playful, somber, and gentle. In discussing these examples, he explains how each of these characters is created. In other words, this is not just a list of orchestral recipes, like we sometimes see in film music. Rather, it encourages students to think about how the instrument can express so many different things when the music is appropriate to the desired character. The first section in this chapter touches on woodwinds, horns, and brass. Each instrument includes examples like the flute ones I listed above. It includes saxophones as well. Then he goes on to strings, and he talks about pizzicato, mutes, double stops, harmonics, tremolos, ponticello, colleno, as well as just using a few solo players. Again, the point is not just to list the possible effects, but to really understand how they influence the character of the music in the various repertoire examples. After discussing the strings, he goes on to various unusual combinations, including harp, organ, piano, mandolin, guitar, celeste, and percussion. There are sections about humorous passages and also more somber characters and how to orchestrate them. At the end of this chapter, Kirchner returns to the quality of the music itself. One can create impressive effects with orchestration, but if the underlying music is mediocre, the listener will not want to hear it again. All the craftsmanship in the world is not worth much if the composer's expressive goals are not well thought out. All through these four volumes, Kirchner's generosity as a teacher is everywhere in evidence. This isn't just an orchestration textbook like the others, but rather a real encyclopedia of everything he knows, always presented in great detail with full explanation. Just being able to provide these thousands of specific examples requires an incredibly deep knowledge of the musical repertoire. I wish someone could provide a collection of audio files for all these examples, but it would be an enormous job, and there would also be many copyright issues. But even for people who don't speak French, just the examples are worth the price of the set. This kind of incredible generosity is rare, and it's characteristic of a great teacher.